Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are you when others revile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. On my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Well, good morning. 11 o'clock, you always gotta, you gotta have a little bit more energy. You've had plenty of time to sleep, so good morning. There you go. We're going to have some fun today. I want to say this. Uh, thank you guys for those who showed up yesterday and helped us clean here at the campus. Thank you guys so much. Uh, for those who weren't here, uh, you get to come to the next one. We'll do one around uh, Easter time as well. We get to do a lot of landscaping and really make our, our outside of the building beautiful. But we got a lot of stuff done inside yesterday and, and it was a, a fun day uh, hanging out and serving together. And I know a lot of the ladies were away at the, uh, at the Prevail Conference and had a great time there as well. So hopefully it was a great weekend for you guys. And, um, and I'm excited to get into God's Word to Today, but also one thing, I know it was in the video as well. How many of you have been part of our, our Convoy of Hope One Day to Feed the World offerings here before? Would you raise your hand? If you're not familiar with that, this is something we do every, every year. We have a special guest speaker next week as well. Uh, this is one of my favorite days. It's a day where we, get to, uh, where we get to really support an organization that does a lot of great work. And so hopefully you receive, how many of you received that little handout when you came in today? If you didn't receive it, there's some at each of those tables. I would encourage you to grab one so you have a little bit of a better understanding of what that day is all about. Uh, this is a day where we get to live out one of our core values, where we are sacrificially generous. We take one day of our income, one day of our salary, and we sacrificially give it to this organization. And our one day changes there every day. They are doing so much good all over the world. Uh, if you have questions about that organization, there's plenty of information that's there. You can go online and look them up as well. But a great organization that we get to partner with. And so so uh, I want you to pray about, as I said in the video, pray about what God lays on your heart to give uh, as we support this organization next week. And you'll get envelopes and we'll take a separate offering next week. But just kind of to kind of keep that in the back of your mind as you're thinking about, make sure you understand a little bit about that organization. But uh, I'm excited to continue our series in the Sermon on the Mount. We're in week number five of our series, Upside Down. If you haven't been here, we've been looking at Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapter five through seven. And we've been exploring what Jesus has to say about the kingdom of God. And the reason we've called it upside down is because we've said that this is a kingdom that is unlike any other kingdom, that in a lot of ways it's upside down from the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus talks about not only what his kingdom looks like, but what do our lives look like or what should our lives look like as citizens as of the kingdom of God, as followers of Christ, that, that our attitudes of our hearts, the way we live our lives, all of these things should look drastically different than somebody who is not a part of the kingdom of God. And so a couple weeks ago, we we started this section of chapter 5 where Jesus looks at the law and he kind of uh, redefines the law and defines the true meaning of the different laws. And he, he gives six different phrases during this portion of the sermon where he says, you have heard, and he lists one of the rules, you have heard, do not murder, whatever it is. Uh, I tell you, and he redefines and, or, or brings clarity to what it means. And so a couple weeks ago, we talked about this idea of murder and anger and, and how the command do not murder is not just a about not physically murdering somebody, but he also talks about the heart behind it because what you understand when Jesus talks about this is it's not just about the actions, it's also about the heart and the motivations and the attitudes of our heart behind. And Jesus is not concerned with just what we do, he's also concerned with our hearts and that's why we're calling this section Heart Issues. So we looked at anger and we said, hey, it's not just about not killing somebody, but it's also about the attitude of our hearts. And, and so if we hold on to anger and we refuse to forgive and we hold things over people and we allow anger to be unforgiven and, and uncontrolled in our lives, it's the same way that, of breaking the law as if we physically murder somebody according to Jesus. This morning we're going to look at the second and third ones that Jesus talks about. He defines for us what it really means to live out his commands when it comes to marriage and divorce and, and lust and adultery and the heart of these issues. And what does it really look like to live as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, pursuing this new type of righteousness as a follower of Christ in this area of our lives? I, I don't know if you know this, but the, the Bible has a lot to say when it comes to marriage and sex. Did you know that? 
The Bible has a, a lot to say when it comes to these areas. And truthfully, most of us in this room today can relate to what we're talking about because you are either married. I know Mari kind of had you raise your hand. You're either married, uh, you, you have been married at some point in your life, or you are going to be married in your future. And so the information, the instructions that we're looking at today will apply to your life in one way, shape, or form. But, but I also want to be clear that this portion of Scripture is a little bit difficult as well. It's a little bit difficult. And often the words of Christ are they bring conviction and they, they strike at areas in our life that are not as they should be. And so I, I want us to hear Jesus' words and the heart behind his words today for, for conviction, but not condemnation, not guilt, not shame. And so with that in mind, let's listen to these words and we're going to explore. Matthew chapter 5, 27 through 32 it says, You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, Everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife except in the case of sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, I know that this portion of Scripture, again, can be difficult for many of us because this idea of adultery and divorce, it hits close to home. It may be part of your your story, part of what you've experienced, whether you grew up in a household where your parents were divorced or whether you were married at one time and you were divorced or, or maybe you had a, a relationship where there was some adultery committed against you in your relationship or, or maybe you were the one who committed adultery in your relationship or maybe there's not the physical act of adultery but you've been part of a relationship where there's been the emotional, the, the mental side of that where there's been some pornography addictions and some, some mental affairs and things going on there and so when we talk about this it's, it's hard for us to talk about at times because the reality is for many of us it hits pretty close to home and so before we explore this further uh, and before we really jump into what God's word says with, with this I want to remind you of God's grace and his forgiveness. I want, you, I want you to understand God's grace and his forgiveness in our lives, whether this is a painful part of your story, a painful part of your past, or something that you're in the midst of right now. I want you to understand that God's grace, his mercy, his forgiveness is there for you. That God loves you, that he is bigger than your sins, that the sins that have also been committed to you, and he's able to redeem the hurt and the pain, even the hurt and pain of adultery and divorce that people have experienced in their lives. See, here's the thing I want you to understand about God. God is a good God. He's a God who loves us. The Bible says he's come to give us life abundantly. It means that God wants us to experience his best in every area of our lives, including in our marriages, including in our sexuality. But the Bible also says that we have a real enemy that's come to steal, kill, and destroy, that wants to bring destruction into every area of your life, wants to rob you and keep you from experiencing God's best in every area of your life. What God wants to bless, Satan wants to curse and destroy. He's constantly at work, constantly fighting, constantly trying to bring destruction. And so as we look at these words today, I want you to understand that God does not want you to ruin your marriages. God does not want you to kill the intimacy uh, that you are supposed to experience when it comes to your sex life. God wants to bless it. He wants you to experience it to the fullest, and he wants you to experience his best in that area of your lives. And so as we look at this passage of Scripture, I want us to see Jesus giving us some boundaries, some healthy boundaries to help us from sabotaging this area of our relationship so we can live and experience his best in this part of our lives. And so before we get into that, before we, we kind of break down that portion of Scripture a little bit more, I want to share a couple thoughts about marriage and, and sex that I think we can see in Scripture that will hopefully give us a better understanding of why Jesus speaks these words the way he speaks these words. And so the first thing, if you're taking notes, I want us to understand, and maybe you do understand this, but I want to say it anyway, God created marriage. And this is really, really basic and important foundation to build up, that God created marriage. Marriage is God's idea. It's his creation. We look all the way back into the creation account in the book of Genesis, and we see God creating Adam. Genesis chapter 2 says God created Adam, and he put him in this garden, and he looks at Adam, and he says, it's not good for man to be alone. We are created to have relationships. We are created to crave, clo crave closeness. We are created with a desire to be known and to know each other deeply and intimately. We were created in the image of God and that is his character in our lives, this desire 
to be known. And so God looks at Adam and he says it's not good for man to be alone. And so he starts to try to fix the problem. And he starts by creating a bunch of animals. And he says, here are these animals and here's your job, Adam. You can name these animals. You live at peace and harmony with these animals. And so I just imagine Adam and he's looking at these animals and he's coming up with creative names for them. He's like, you kind of look like a monkey and you look like an elephant and you look like a giraffe. I don't know what a giraffe is, but you look like a giraffe. You got a weird neck and all these different things. He's just kind of going through the motion. He's naming all those animals. But at the end of the day, there's not this, this close relationship. Maybe he's sitting in the garden, he's playing catch with a lion or something because they're perfect peace. And he's trying to have a conversation with the monkeys, but there's just, you know, miscommunication there because it's a monkey and they don't talk. And it's just, something's not right, something's missing. And God recognizes this and says, this is, this is still not it. This is still not filling the void, this void of relationship that is there. So what the Bible says is that God causes Adam to go into a deep sleep. The type of sleep that you can do a surgery on somebody. He causes them to go into a deep sleep. He opens up his side, takes out one of his rib, and from the rib forms the very first woman. And he wakes Adam up from his deep sleep, and Adam looks for the first time on this woman that God has created, and he's like, that's what I'm talking about, God. That is, that's much better. In fact, this is what the Bible says in Genesis 2, verse 23. It says, at last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from me. This is exactly how I picture it happening because I'm a guy and I'm simple. So he woke up from his sleep and he saw her for the very first time and they were both naked. And he looked at her and he was like, whoa, man. He's like, I'm going to call her woman because that's, that's what I said. Whoa, man, it's just simpler than saying that all the time. And that's how he got creative with her name because it's like, God, you did a good job. A plus on that one. Much better than the giraffe. Like much better work there. <laughs> the Bible says in verse 24, explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. It says the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. This is a picture of God instituting the very first marriage, joining together the very first husband and wife. This is God defining what marriage is. One man, one woman, created to be one flesh for life. Now I know the culture we live in tries to define marriage in many different ways. But they didn't create marriage. So they don't get to define marriage. God defines marriage. And he defines it as one man and one woman, as one flesh for life. And not only did God create marriage, Jesus in the New Testament reaffirms God's plan for marriage. In Matthew chapter 19, he says, haven't you read the scriptures? They recorded that from the beginning, God made them male and female, just in case we needed clarity. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one, since they are no longer two, but one. Let no one split apart what God has joined together. We have to understand, first and foremost, marriage is God's idea. It's his divine plan for us to experience and fill that relational void that all of us have been experiencing in our lives because he's created us for relationships. Number two, we have to also understand that sex is a gift from God in marriage. This idea we see in these verses about being one flesh is talking about The sexual relationship. He's saying that a man and woman should be united in marriage. They're no longer two, but they are one. And just as God created marriage, God also created sex. And it's been given to us to be a good gift that we get to experience between a husband and wife in the context of marriage. It's not like God left the garden. He he left for like 15 minutes and he came back and he was like, "What, what are you two doing? Like, I know you're naked and all, but like, how did you perverts figure that out? Like, he didn't, he didn't do that. God created them. He created them to experience intimacy. He created them to experience sex. He made their bodies. He made their bodies compatible with each other. He gave them the ability to enjoy that, not just for procreation, but also for pleasure. God is not against against sex. God is for sex. He is pro-sex. He wants you to enjoy it, but he wants you to enjoy it in the way that he's created you to enjoy it. See, if you want to understand how something works best or how something is made to be used, you go to the creator. So you look at God's plan, God's creation, and you want to know how it's meant to be enjoyed, meant to be experienced, then you look at God. And God says, this is how you're created to experience. This is what I created, and this is how you can enjoy it to the fullest. Now again, because of sin and because of our enemy, who is always trying to, I always say this, like Satan 
Satan is always trying to distort. God creates, Satan always counterfeits. He always tries to distort. He always tries to, to, to make a false side of what God has created. And so here is God creating this, and here is Satan trying to destroy it and bring confusion. And we see that all throughout our culture, that there's constantly these ideas of confusion and this misplaced ideas when it comes to human sexuality all over our world because we have a real enemy that wants to destroy everything that God's created and doesn't want us to experience what God has made to the fullest. And we see in our culture especially, there's two often very very wrong views, extremes of sex that we see that distort what God has created. The first one, we see that, that people often feel like sex is gross, whether it's because of, uh, of sexual abuse or perversion that they've experienced in their lives. And the truth is, even in a room like this in first service as well, the statistics would say that there is many of you in this room, both male and female, that have experienced that in your life. You've experienced some kind of abuse, some kind of sexual perversion in your, your life. And when you go through those things and you experience those things, it's really easy for, for you to allow those those things to begin to define what sex is and, and, and it sometimes gets to a place where you just look at sex from a lens that is not what God has created it to be. It's just gross or, or maybe even uh, times where people have grown up and, and they've been taught, well, sex is just kind of a necessary evil. It's what you have to do to produce children, but it's not something that's supposed to be enjoyed. It's just a, something you do to make kids and they've been taught that and so they have this misplaced view of sexuality that is just about those things and it's not about enjoyment and it's not true. That's not what God's word says. The other extreme of that that we often see is not that sex is gross, but that sex is God. Instead of something created by God to be enjoyed in marriage, we take his created thing and we begin to worship it as God. We chase after pleasure and fulfillment above all else. If something feels good, if it feels right to me, if it gives me pleasure, then it has to be okay. That's why we see the pornography industry as at an all-time high. Some estimates would say between uh, 10 and $15 billion a year in America alone. I mean, I could give you some of the stats on pornography if I, if I had them up here with you and you would be staggered by how much people are struggle with that and how many people are, are in that lifestyle and who, are, who are, are addicted to that and using that constantly time and time again. The ages that kids are first exposed to that has got younger and younger. I believe they say the average age now is 10 years old. The first time that a, a, a young person sees some kind of pornographic material that distorts God's plan of sexuality in their, their mind, plants an image of what God, what God says is good and takes it and distorts it and makes it gross. It's just the reality of the world we live in. We have to understand that sex is not gross and, and sex is not made to be something that we worship. It's not made to be God. It's made to be a gift from God that he has given to us and created for us to enjoy in his perfect plan of marriage. And then the third thing I want us to understand about marriage and sex is that intimacy is the ultimate goal of sex and marriage. The purpose of sex is it's not just about the physical act. It's supposed to be so much more than that. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, it says this. It says, now Adam, he knew Eve, his wife. In other versions of that verse, in other interpretations of that verse, it says that Adam was intimate with his wife. Another version said that Adam had sexual relations with his wife. And the reason, if you read on, it says, and she became pregnant, so you know that's what's going on. And that word new, that word that they're using there for new is a word that, that means intimacy. It's this Greek word yada. And that word yada means to know completely and be completely known. Come on, how many of you in here, if you're married, you have kids, you've had to come up with creative code word in your house? You know what I'm talking about? Some of you are embarrassed you're laughing, but you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to point anybody out, but I know you got a word in your house. You know, like, you have a word that you look at your, your spouse and you say it and they know what you mean. I gave you a new word today. Unless your kids are in here, then they ruined it. You just look at your wife and be like, yada? She says, yada, yada? It's, it's game on, right? Like, it's go time. Make it happen. Put the kids to bed. Do what you need to do. But that word, yada, right, to know completely and be completely known, that's a, a word that expresses intimacy. That's a word that shows, and, and listen, it's not just about the physical. Even though it's used to explain the physical, it's so much more than the physical. It's talking about not just a physical connection, but, a, but an emotional and a spiritual connection. It's the, the most intimate of connections that we are made to experience in this life. It's the intimacy that God wants us to experience in our marriages between a husband and wife. And the crazy thing about that, it's also the word that is often used in scripture to explain the type of intimacy that God desires to have with us. The type of closeness. In 
Psalms 139, verses 1 through 6, it says this, O Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know, that's the word yada, you know everything about me. You know, yada, when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. The same way that God knows us. Same way that he knows every, every hair on your head, every detail of your life. He knows every sin, every failure, every flaw, every imperfection that you try to hide from everybody else. The same way that God knows those things, yet he continues to pursue you, to love you, to desire to have a relationship with you, to change your life. The same way that God intimately pursues you is the same word that he uses to, 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 to explain the type of intimacy that he desires for us to experience in marriage. Why? Our marriages are supposed to be a visual reminder, a visual example to the world of the relationship that God wants to have with broken people. Our marriages are supposed to be pointing people to the truth of the gospel. As followers of Christ, that's why we should be taking marriage seriously because, listen, when we allow sin to enter into our marriages, when we allow unfaithfulness and what these verses are talking about to enter into that marriage covenant, it brings destruction. It brings an end to the covenant. It brings pain and suffering. It breaks off the intimacy that we're supposed to be living out and showing the world who Christ is through our marriages. And so that's why these words of Jesus are so strong when it comes to adultery and divorce because marriage is meant to be that one relationship we experience on this earth between another person that most closely resembles the way that God loves his bride, the church. And so as we think back on Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5, we're going to we're going to look at those words and when it comes to adultery and divorce. And, and what I want you to see today is not just a bunch of laws, not just a bunch of commands, not just a bunch of guilt and condemnation. But what I want you to see from these verses is boundaries. What I want you to see from these verses is that God loves you. And he's passionate about your marriage. And he's passionate about you experience his best in your life. And he wants to give you some guidelines to divorce-proof your marriage. Now, you may be in here and you may not be able to go back and change your past. Some of you have been, are, have been divorced and are remarried. You can use this and apply this to your current marriages so you don't go through the same thing again. Some of you, you might be on the ropes when it comes to your marriage. Your marriage might be falling apart. And some of these things are practical instructions that you can begin to put into place to save your marriage before it hits destruction. Five things we can see in this portion of scripture when it comes to divorce proof in our marriages. The first thing starts with our hearts. We need to learn to guard our hearts. Verse 28, Jesus clearly shows that, that adultery starts in the heart, that it's a heart issue before it's ever acted upon action in our, our lives. You know, no one wakes up one day and says, you know, I think I'm going to have an affair today. I think, you know, I think, you know what I want to do? I think I want to ruin my marriage today. I think I want to like ruin my kid's life. I think I want to ruin my, my spouse's life. I think I, I want to destroy. No, nobody wakes up one day and just all of a sudden decides that. But what ends up happening is the, the heart of adultery takes root in your life way before the action of adultery is lived out in your life. So we need to learn to protect our heart. We read this verse a couple weeks ago when talking about anger in Matthew 15, 19, but it also talks about adultery. It says, for from the heart come evil thoughts and murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. See, the Pharisees, they looked at this as just a checkbox, right? As long as you don't sleep with somebody who's not your spouse, you're okay. You haven't broken the command. Jesus looks at it and says, that's not true because this starts in your heart way before it's lived out in your actions. And so if you're walking in adultery in your heart, heart and you're allowing this to take root in your heart way before it ever lived out in your actions you're just as guilty of breaking this command as if you actually lived out now listen that's not to say that if you've committed adultery in your heart you might as well go ahead and actually commit adultery outside because can I tell you that those commands and those things have different consequences like there's different consequences that come from adultery in your heart versus adultery lived out. There's more destruction that is brought in your marriage, in your relationship when it's lived out. And that's a, that's a trick that the enemy would try to get you to play. Well, you've already lived this out in your heart. You might as well just act upon it because you've already failed in this area. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is it's not just about focusing on the list of to do and to don't because that's what we do in our human nature. Well, as long as I don't do this, I'm okay. And what Jesus would say, it's not just about the action. It's about your heart. You need to guard your heart. You need to protect your heart. Because that's where this starts. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your hearts above all else, for it determines the course of your life. You understand that? The direction of your life, the direction and the trajectory of your marriage starts in your heart. 
The actions that are going to happen in the future in your marriage are right now happening in your heart. So you need to guard your heart. You need to protect your heart. You need to put a boundary over your heart so you don't allow anything to take root there that's going to lead to sinful action in the future. So how do we do this? It's both practical and intentional. It's really, really practical, but it's also really, really intentional. Psalms 119 says it like this. It says, how can a young person stay pure? How can anybody walk in purity? By obeying your word. I have tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. Verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We have to understand adultery, first and foremost, is not just a sin against our spouse. It's a sin against God. He's the one that we're ultimately accountable to. So guarding your heart starts first and foremost with surrendering your hearts to Christ. Something that happens when we become a new follower of Christ, the Bible says that he does this spiritual heart trance when he takes out our old heart, our heart of, our, our heart of flesh, our heart of stone, our heart that is at odds with God. And he does a spiritual heart transplant, takes that out and he puts a new heart into us. He gives us a new heart with new desires that's in line with the new creation that he says that we are. That's a, a miracle that God does in our lives, but guess what? There's still work to be done in our lives to protect that heart, to guard that heart, to submit that heart to him. And, and just like if you get a new heart through a heart transplant, but you continue to do all the things you did before, right? Eat unhealthy, eat a lot of salt, all this kind of stuff, you can cause damage to your new heart. And we do the same things in our lives. We have a new heart, we're a new creation, but we need to make sure that we are protecting our heart. We are submitting our heart to God's truth. We are submitting and building our hearts on the foundation of his word every single day so that we can have the right foundation. Psalms 51.10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. This is David after he had made one of the greatest mistakes and sins and failings in his life. Repenting to God. God, create in me a clean heart. I've messed up. Give me a new heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my trespasses. God, I need a new heart. I want the right heart. I want to have a heart that honors you. That should be our heart's prayer all the time. We need to be continually asking God to show us anything in our hearts that is not as it should be. Come on, that's a difficult prayer to pray at times, isn't it? Because it's easy for us to see when our actions are wrong. It's a lot harder for us to recognize when our motives of our heart are wrong. So God, show me anything in my heart that is not what it should be. Show me anything I've allowed to take root in my heart that is leading me towards something that's going to bring destruction in my life. Guard our heart. Number two, you need to protect your eyes. Jesus said in this verse, even looking with lustful intent, looking lustfully at a woman is the same as committing adultery. It's adultery of the heart. Now, it's important that we understand what Jesus is saying here because a lot of times people have taught that this is, you know, just anytime you think somebody's pretty or attractive or handsome or whatever else and you've committed adultery. And that's not what this verse is saying. It's saying when we look with lustful intent, when we look with a heart of desire for somebody that is not our spouse, when we look at another version that probably more appropriate uh, interpretation of this is when we look at somebody with a covetous heart, a heart to say, hey, I know that's not my spouse, I know that's not my husband, my wife, but I want them, I'm gonna take them. They belong to, it's a, it's a heart of, of misplaced desire. He says, when you look with lustful intent, and the truth is most of us can understand when we are doing the different things. Most of us can understand when our hearts go from a place of saying, okay, somebody is pretty or somebody is handsome to a place where we have lustful desire in our hearts for them. And he's saying, when you look with that lustful desire, with that wrong intent, that's when you've begun to commit adultery in your heart. And so we need to learn to protect our eyes because our eyes are the gateway to our hearts and mind. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, he says, your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. And when your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. In other words, what we continue to dwell on with our eyes, what we continue to focus on in our eyes will produce the fruit that comes out of our lives. If we want to live healthy lives that produce the fruit of righteousness, then we need to protect and guard our eyes because our eye becomes the gateway to the actions that eventually come out in our lives. And when our eyes are not healthy and we don't guard our eyes and, and protect what we see, then we eventually produce the wrong type of fruit because it takes root in our hearts in our minds. And so practically, what do we need to do? We do what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4 where it says, God's will for you is that you'd be holy. So stay away from sexual sin then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God in his ways. What he's saying is this, that if you're a follower of Christ, God's will for your life is for you to walk in holiness, to be set apart, to live different, not in lustful passions, not giving yourself over to sexual passions, whether that's adultery in your marriage or whether that's sex outside of marriage. All of these things are covered in that. 
Any type of, of sexual, just in case we're, un, 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 just so we understand this, any type of, of sexual relationship that is not what we talked about in the beginning, which is in the, the covenant of a, of a relationship between a husband and wife in marriage, is considered sin in God's word. He's not okay with any of it. It's not how he created it to be experienced. Any time that we, in, 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 we, we take part in sex outside of God's plan, it's called sexual immorality. And so what he's saying is that you need to learn to control every member of your body and walk in holiness. Can I tell you, your eye is one of those members. If you're going to walk in holiness in, in your actions when it comes to your sex, sex life, then you, it starts by, by learning to protect your eyes because your eyes are that gateway, that lamp. That often leads to sin. So we need to be careful and diligent with what we feast our eyes on. We may not always be, be able to stop ourselves from seeing something. Come on, that's the reality. We live in a broken world. You could be watching TV and something comes on that was not what you were expecting. There's something in a movie that is not necessary that is there. You might be at the gym. Somebody walks by. You, you may not be able to control the first look, but you are responsible for the next look. You're responsible for what you dwell on. You're responsible for what you deal with. And, and the Bible is clear that if you don't learn to protect your eyes, guard your heart. Even in, in Job, Job 31, verse 1, he says, I have, I've made a covenant with my eyes to not look at a woman lustfully. He says, it's between me and my eyes. I've made an agreement with my eyes. I've made a promise to my eyes that I'm not going to look at somebody lustfully. I'm not going to lust after somebody that is not my spouse. That's the seriousness that we need to take this with. Guard your hearts, protect your eyes. The third thing, we need to fight temptation. When Jesus talks in these verses about plucking out your eye, gouging out your eye, he talks about cutting off your arms, I just want you to understand, he's not talking literally. And it's important because there is people in history who've read that and taken it literally. And they're walking around, but the, can I be honest with you? You could pluck out your eye, you could cut off your arm, and you'll still find a way to sin because you still have a brain. Like, it's just the reality of, 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 of the situation. You still have one eye. Even if you got rid of both of them, there's still things that you've seen that you could dwell on with lustful intent if you want. What he's saying there is not that we literally need to cut off our arms. We need to plug. He's saying we need to take this seriously, just as seriously as, as removing something like that. So we need to be serious with doing everything possible to destroy the things that, that tempt us towards sin. And again, understanding that temptation in itself is not sin. We all experience temptation in our lives. It's what we do with the temptation that often leads to sin. In James chapter 1, he says, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. And then these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Temptation, when we don't deal with it properly, when we don't resist it, when we don't fight it, when we just give in to it, leads to sin. And when we don't deal with that sin, the Bible says it leads to death. Specifically what we're talking about today, it leads to death to marriages, death to intimacy. We need to deal with these things. We need to fight temptation. In James chapter 4, it says it like this. How do we do this? What do we do to fight temptation? What do we do to walk this out? Well, in James 4, 7, it says, so humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's people who go, well, look, and I, listen, I'll never, I'll never, ever fall. I'll never, ever make that mistake. My marriage is stronger than that. I'm stronger than that. I'm, 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 listen, I got this. You know, you're not even talking to me. You're talking to everybody else here today, but you're not talking to me because I'm, I'm really, really strong. Like, can I tell you something? That pride that you're walking in right there, that's not a good place to be. In fact, the Bible says that pride comes before destruction. Pride comes before a fall. We have to understand that it's going to take humility to walk in obedience in every area of our lives. Understanding that if we are not building on the right foundation, we are not seeking after God in every area of our lives all the time, that we, just like everybody else, can fall prey to sin's attacks. The Bible says that Satan goes around like a roaring lion, seeking those who he may devour. He's looking for people who are walking in pride. He's looking for people who do not have their guards up, who aren't protecting themselves, who aren't guarding their hearts, who aren't protecting their minds. And he's looking for them and he's saying look that's an easy target right there that's a person I can attack right there that's a person I can throw something out to right there because your guard is not up and you're not resisting the devil as he says here we have to resist actively push back at his attacks and not only that there's times we're not only resisting but we're also called to run first Corinthians 6 18 through 20 it says run Flee sexual immorality. No other sin so clearly affects your body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your bodies. And so what does this look like, practically speaking, in our lives? When it comes to this cutting off, so to speak, gouging out our eyes, so to speak, what does this look like, really practical in our lives? Well, it might mean... 
that if you have cable and you are struggling when it comes to lust and you don't have a lot of self-control in your life, then maybe you need to, to get rid of that for a while. Because it's not worth going down the path that you're going down when it comes to what you're constantly looking at. Maybe it means putting some kind of accountability software on your phones, on your computers, making your spouse your accountability partner so that you don't go down paths that you shouldn't go. It's going to sometimes mean taking drastic steps. There might be some of you who are working at a job and, and at that job you're, you, you've got a little bit too comfortable with somebody that's not your spouse. You, you talk to them about all the problems that you're having in your relationship and you don't think it's that big of a deal, but you're building an emotional connection that's not made to be there but with, with anybody other than your spouse. And the best decision you can make, the most holy decision you can make, the most drastic step you could make to keep yourself from going down a path that you will not be able to come back from would be to quit that job, to leave that job, say, I can't afford it, but you can't afford not to. Because you're going down a path that you're not going to recover from if you're not careful. It means we need to do everything we can to fight and to flee temptation. That's what he's saying. Take any drastic measure we need to take. Put any boundary in place that you need to put. Do whatever you need to do to not fall into the temptation that you're struggling with, that you're dealing with in your life. The fourth thing that we need to do according to Scripture is I would encourage you if you want to divorce-proof your marriage is you got to destroy those intimacy blockers. Destroy those things in your life that block intimacy. Now I know what some of you are thinking, you can't do that. Because it's illegal to get rid of your kids. <laughs> and that's, that's not what we're talking about. Although they can be intimacy blockers sometimes, can't, is that right? How many of you have kids? And they've ever knocked on a door and you wanted to like, tell them they're not allowed to live in your house anymore. It's part of it. That's not what we're talking about, though. There's a verse in the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, that says this. It says, catch all the foxes, these little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love, for the grapevines are blossoming. You might be thinking, what's that have to do with this? Song of Solomon is a, is a, is a story that's it's really a love story between a, a couple that gets married and their love is just in that new, that honeymoon stage of their marriage. And here's this couple, and they're, they're just really growing in their intimacy. They're growing in their trust. They're growing in their relationship. And they're talking about their marriage. And they said, catch the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard. They're talking about this intimacy, and they're talking about these, these foxes that have the potential to destroy their intimacy and to bring and wreak havoc in their relationship. I don't know if you know this about, like, foxes are kind of cute, right? Have you ever seen a fox running around? It's kind of a cute animal. It doesn't, it's not like a scary predator. You feel like you could have one as a pet. It'd be pretty awesome. I don't know. Like, I've seen, they make cool sounds. I've seen videos of people who have them as, like, like pets. I don't know why, but they have them as pets. And they, they make really neat sounds. And they're kind of cute. And they're whatever. And I see them outside. And, you know, it's, they're, they're cute animals. But they're predators. And they're not really that scary. They're not like if you ran into a mountain lion. Like I feel like if you saw a fox, if you saw a mountain lion, you're running away. If you saw a fox, you're like in your mind, you're thinking, if this thing comes at me, I could pretty sure I could punt this. Like I could punt this thing away and I could survive. That's like just the reality. But at the same time, they're still, they're still predators and they still can cause havoc. And what would happen at that time is sometimes foxes would get into the vineyard and they couldn't reach the fruit, so they couldn't eat the fruit of the vine. But what they would do is they would go to the base of the vine and they would chew on the base of the vine. They would chew on the roots. They would dig around the roots. And what would end up happening is if you didn't get rid of them, eventually they would cause destruction. They would cause the, the, vine, the, the, the vine to die, which would then kill all the fruit. And so they were little things that caused big problems. And so what I think He's talking about there is, is understanding this. Like it's easy for us sometimes to avoid the big things. It's easy for us to understand the big consequences of, of, of actually having an affair, right? Like we know the consequence of, of walking that. We know the consequences of, of things in our lives that we don't repent from. We understand the destruction that they can bring. But it's a lot harder for us sometimes to, to recognize the little things that we allow in our, our marriage that ends up blocking the intimacy. And so let me give you a couple examples of what those look like. The first thing is sometimes it can be misplaced priorities and neglect. It's, it's really easy in times in marriage for things to get out of order. How many of you understand? You might have got married, great intentions, you love each other, all that, but then life happens. 
Sometimes careers happen, job changes happen, kids happen. Like these things take place in our lives. And it's easy at times for, for things in our marriages to get all kinds of out of order. And so I want you to understand that if you're a follower of Christ and you want to live a life that honors God in your, in your life, in every area of your life, the God-given order of what you should be pursuing is this. It should be God first and foremost in your life and in your marriage. It should be your spouse, then your children, and then your career. Anytime that gets out of order, it's going to invite chaos and destruction into your intimacy. Anytime you pursue anything above God, it's going to bring separation. And it's going to take away from the intimacy that God wants you to experience. Anytime that you elevate your kids above your spouse, it's going to bring a lack of intimacy in your life. And let me just be honest with you. I know you love your kids, but eventually your kids are going to leave your house, hopefully, right? And your spouse is still going to be there. And when that happens, you don't want to be like, who are you, stranger? Because all you did was invest in your kids and not invest in your spouse. And you let things get out of order. Anytime you put your career before those things, well, I got to work to provide for them. Yeah, but if you don't have a family to provide for and a marriage and a, and a spouse to go through life with, then is the job really worth it? Because you're providing for them to pay for the divorce you're going to go through because you haven't invested in that relationship. Anytime those get out of order, things get arise. So we have to understand that's a little fox that can destroy. And oftentimes it starts out small, but when you don't deal with it, it becomes bigger. Another one is constant criticism, complaining, and comparing. It's easy, isn't it, at times, because there's a lot of comfort in marriage for that person to be the one person that we feel we can just, I mean, like, this would be real. Like, that's the person that you know. You know their flaws. You know their mistakes. You're the one who's seen their failures more than anybody else. You see who they are when nobody else is around. Like, there's a lot of comfort there. And sometimes with that comfort and proximity, it's really, really, really easy to just let that person be a safe person for you to constantly criticize, constantly complain, constantly compare. And let me tell you, those things can be really, really dangerous because they can start out small and innocent, but if you don't take care of them, you don't get rid of them, they can become big things in your, your marriage. If you're constantly criticizing and you're never speaking anything encouraging over each other, how many of you understand that that can bring destruction and kill intimacy? If you're constantly compa complaining about them to, to, to them or even to other people, you're talking to your parents about how bad your husband is or how bad your wife is, that's not a good thing that brings intimacy and puts intimacy dream and brings destruction. If you're constantly uh, complaining or comparing them to everybody else, I wish you were so much more like this person. I wish you were like this person I saw in the Hallmark movie. They're so romantic and you kind of stink at all that, right? Like if you're constantly comparing, criticizing and complaining, it brings, brings blockage to your intimacy that God wants you to experience. So you need to deal with it. Another one, unforgiveness and bitterness. And these two are really, really connected because bitterness grows out of unforgiveness. Can I tell you that marriage is going to give you a really, really good opportunity to learn how to walk in forgiveness? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Like there's a lot of opportunities to practice forgiveness in marriage. You're so close to that person. They're going to offend you. They're going to tick you off. I heard somebody say like this, marriage is that one relationship where you know how to push each other's buttons and, th and then you push them for fun sometimes. Is that true? Like you know the things that annoy your spouse and sometimes you just do it on purpose. You know how to push those buttons. Can I tell you that marriage is a perfect opportunity for you to live out the command to forgive as you've been forgiven? The best marriages are the marriages where both people are committed to forgiving each other. Not holding on to anger, not holding on to bitterness, not allowing those things to take root in their lives. And so forgive each other and don't allow bitterness in your marriage. And number four, hidden sin. A little fox that can bring big destruction. You know, is there anything in your marriage that you're keeping from your spouse? Are there any hidden passwords that you purposely hide? Are there any relationships that are not right in your life that you've allowed to take root? Are there anything in your, you know, that if your, your spouse saw that they would not be okay with? I mean, just think about that for a moment in your life. And again, I'm not trying to bring condemnation, but ultimately conviction from the Holy Spirit so that you can experience the intimacy that God wants you to experience because right now these are little foxes that are keeping you from experiencing God's best in your marriage. So hidden sin is really, really powerful in our, our marriages and powerful in our lives because it's in darkness. When things are in darkness, they feel like they have power. When things are exposed to the light, they lose the power that they once held. And here's the reality, God knows everything. You can't really hide anyway. This is that your sins will find you out. Understanding that, that, at, at, that your, your, what is done in darkness will eventually be revealed in the light. And it's better for you to reveal it, seek forgiveness and repentance and, and, walk in, and walk in that reconciliation than for you to be caught and have to get forgiveness from there. It's better for you to reveal it to the light to find healing. 
than to wait to that point. And so I would just encourage you, deal with those areas of hidden sin. Deal with those areas that are blocking the intimacy in your marriage so that you can experience God's best. And then the last thing I would encourage us with when it comes to divorce proofing our marriages is you need to prioritize your marriage. I heard people say before, well, you know, the grass is always greener somewhere else. How many of you ever th- heard that, th- that phrase? Well, the grass is greener somebody else. The grass is greener over there. I mean, in, in, I, gu- I guess the grass would be greener if I had a different spouse. I guess the grass would be greener if I was married somebody else. I didn't marry the right person. We come up with all kinds of excuses. Can I tell you where the grass is greenest? I grew up uh, in Bartow, and we had this big mound in our back hill. You know what I'm talking about? The septic tank was under there. You know where the grass was greenest? Over the septic tank. Because that's where the fertilizer is. Right? And the same is true in our marriages. Like if you want to have a great marriage, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to fertilize it. You're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to prioritize it. You're going to have to fight for it. I would encourage you to put the same amount of effort and time that you've put into looking for a way out of your marriage into making your marriage as best as it could possibly be. So let's get practical with it as we close today. Real practical steps that we can take to prioritize our marriage. Number one, I would encourage you to pursue God together. Pursue God together. Build your lives individually and together as a, as a married couple on the foundation of Christ. Read and, read and, and, and pray and, and read the Bible together. Do devotions together. Do whatever you need to do. Serve together. Like just make serving Christ a priority in your marriage and in your family. Another thing, don't hold on to anger but be quick to forgive. How many of you have ever gone to bed angry and you wake up in the morning and the, the anger is magically gone? No, you, get, you wake up and you're just as angry. You just had a bad night's sleep instead. Or maybe your spouse is sleeping and you're looking at them and you, you're thinking of ways to murder them in your sleep. You're breaking both last week's and this week's command. Because somehow they're sleeping while you're still mad. Right? Be people who deal with your anger. Don't go to bed angry. Don't allow bitterness and unforgiveness to take root in your marriage. Be quick to forgive. Another one, ready? Prioritize your date life. Some of you are like, I don't remember, I don't know what a date is. I don't remember what that is like. I got too many, you know how many kids I have? I got too many kids. I'd have to take another mortgage out to pay for childcare. Can I tell you what's more expensive than going on a date? Divorce lawyer. That's more expensive than going on a date. And here's the thing I'll tell you, and I said in the first service as well. A date night does not have to be expensive. It just needs to be without the kids to make it a date night. Like, you just need to get away from the kids, look each other in the eyes. Listen, I'm just going to put this plug out there. Our parking lot is big. You can just come park here and make out in the car if you want. Get back to that, whatever you want to do. There's no cameras out there uh, that I know of. Um, So enjoy time. Listen, I'm telling you, just get away from your kids. Look each other in the eyes. Remind yourselves of why you love each other. And take time together to reignite those flames that you had in the beginning of your marriage. Another really practical one. I'm just going to say it. Have lots of sex in your marriage. You can say amen to that. Listen, even if you're with you can say amen to that. That's true. Listen, I'll, it's in the Bible. I'll give you scripture. I didn't have it in the notes, but you can write this one down and read it later. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7 talks about this. It says, if you're married, do not withhold from each other. Husbands, your body is your wife's. It belongs to her. Wives, your body is your husband's. It belongs to him, it's not your own. So husbands, this is what you can do. You can look at your wife and you can just point at yourself and be like, this is all yours. <laughs> I've, been, I've been growing to enlarge. There's just more to love than when we first got married. You have a scripture for that now. It says, do not withhold from each other unless you both agree for a season of, of prayer and fasting. That means you can't just be like, no, I want to pray and fast instead of being with you. It means if you both agree for a season of prayer and fasting, but then the Bible says, but then come back together so that you don't give an opportunity to the enemy to come into your relationship and bring separation and kill the intimacy. Listen, God is not against you enjoying what he has created for you to enjoy. He just wants you to enjoy it the way he's created you to enjoy it. And listen, you know I have no filter, so I'll say whatever God puts on my heart to say, and I have no shame. My wife's not here, so I can't even embarrass her in this service. Enjoy what God has given you in the context of what he has given you. Remembering our marriages as followers of Christ are supposed to be a walking, talking, living, visual illustration of the love that God has for people who are lost. So I want to encourage you, pursue marriage that honors God. Pursue a marriage that chases after God in every area of your life. Don't settle for less than God's best. Don't allow the enemy to bring destruction. Don't allow the enemy to bring separation. Don't allow him to kill the intimacy in your marriage and in your 
your life. Fight for your marriage. Would you stand with me as we close today? We're going to do something a little different as we close. We're going to take some time to worship and take communion. And if you, if you didn't get communion when you came in here and you'd like to take communion, just raise your hand. One of our greedy, greeter team will be around to, to hand that to you. Before we would do that, I want to... This is kind of a weird sermon to give an opportunity for somebody to give their life to Christ, but we're going to do it anyway. Because ultimately when we take communion, we take this from a heart of already having a relationship with God. And if we don't know Jesus, this really doesn't mean much. It's just going through the motions, a religious act. But when we know Christ, this, this matters because it's a time to reflect on what God has done for us, bringing us into his family, making us a new creation in Christ, not because of what we've done, but because of what he has done for us. We've talked about this throughout every single one of these, and we've looked back at this verse as we've looked at these things. We've looked back at, at Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, where he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, because the reality is most of us in here maybe could say, well, we've never, we've never actually committed adultery. But when we look at what the Bible says is adultery of the heart, most of us have broken that command in one way, shape, or form. And again, the point of that is not to bring condemnation. The point of that is to bring us back to what we learned in the very first week, that God blesses those who are poor in spirit. It's to bring us back to that place where we realize that there is nothing we could do in and of ourselves, in and of our religious actions to get ourselves to God. That's why Jesus came to us and did for us what we could never do. He became sin for us, took the punishment of sin for us so that we could be right with God. If you're in here today and you don't know Christ, we're going to take communion in a moment. But don't take communion with not surrendering your life to Christ. It doesn't matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter. Look, I, it doesn't even matter. You might have been here. You might be here today. And you might have been married and divorced multiple times, had multiple affairs. There's a story in the Bible, the woman at the well. Read that one. And look how Jesus lo loves you. That your sin and your past and your failures do not define you. What defines you is what Jesus did for you on the cross. And you're going to stand before God someday. And you're going to either stand before him trying to, to get into heaven based on your own merits and what you've done. Or you're going to stand there knowing that you don't deserve it. Knowing that you failed but that Jesus did it for you in your place. So if you don't know Christ today, as we close in prayer, I want to just encourage you to surrender your heart to Christ. To receive that new heart. That new, become that new creation that he promises you to become. For the rest of us today, as we close in communion... We're not going to do this the same way that we usually do. I'm not going to come back up here and lead us through communion. Instead, what I want us to do today is if you're here with your spouse, I want you guys to take communion together. I want you to take a moment to pray together. I want you to take a moment to deal with the brokenness and the sin and the things that you've allowed into your relationship that have broken intimacy. I want you to deal with those things before you take communion together. I want you to remember that Jesus died on the cross, not just for your own sins, but also for the sins that you've committed against each other in your marriage. So seek forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, if you didn't come with your spouse or you're not married, maybe you came with your family, you can do communion with your family. Maybe you came with a friend, you can do communion with a friend. Maybe you came by yourself and you just want to take a couple moments to reflect. I would just encourage you as we close in worship, take a few moments to reflect on what communion is all about. To reflect on the fact that Jesus' blood was shed, his body was broken for you, for your healing, so you could be made healed and whole. That your past does not define you, your mistakes and your failures do not define you, you're defined by Jesus and what he accomplished for you on the cross. And so just take a few moments to think about that sacrifice, to remember what he's done for you and celebrate communion together. So Father, today we thank you, God. Lord, I pray for anybody who is in here today who doesn't yet know you, God, I pray right now that they would surrender their lives and their hearts to you. God, I pray for any marriages today that are broken, that you would bring reconciliation. God, I pray for anybody who's carrying around a heart of guilt and condemnation and shame because of things that have happened in their past. I pray that they would receive your forgiveness, that they would understand that their sins of their past do not define them, that they would go forward as a new creation living for you and doing and following you in every area of their lives, including their marriage now. God, I pray that you would do a work in our lives. God, let us take this time to remember your sacrifice. Remember who you are. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. God, I thank you that your desire is that we would experience great intimacy, great marriages, a great sex life, God, that you've created us to experience, but it would be in the context and the way that you've created us to experience. And we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.